All right, Jennifer. Jennifer, oh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I grew up in Colorado. I graduated from a tiny little high school with 79 people in my graduating class. Tell me about your family. You know, normal family, I guess. Two brothers, mom, dad. Uh, I joined the military at 17 to kind of just get away from the small town and see what I could make of myself. You joined the military in, how long was that? Five years. Five years. Yeah. That was a good experience? Yeah, it's like the best of times, worst of times, right? Mm -hmm. How would you describe your childhood in general? It was rough, you know, like money's, money was hard, uh, money was tight, um, education in short supply, you know, so it's kind of hard scrabble, I guess you'd say. What was your relationship like with your mom and dad? My mom, she's, she's a good person. She's, um, she always encourages me, whatever I wanted to do, you know, like, oh, you could be an astronaut, like, Mom, I'm not that smart. I couldn't have been an astronaut. But uh, yeah, she was good. And my dad's just, you know, he is who he is. Which is what? <clears throat> Which is not worthy of mention, hmm. honestly. And then after the military? Uh, after the military, I, I got married right out of, right out of the military. And uh, I had a lot of stuff going on and... It was like, I don't know, just uh, I got into acting as like a way of dealing with the stuff I was going through. And it was great because you could either go to the VA and the VA would be like, you know, what's wrong with you? Or you could go to an audition and they'd be like, wow, your mental illness is so vulnerable. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're so vulnerable. We applaud this. And so I was like, wow, I could get paid to like be wackadoo or I could just go to the VA and be mocked. So I chose the more interesting option. You became an actor. Yeah. And it's worked out pretty well. That's good. <laughs> yeah. You're in the right town for it now. Yeah, I am. It's worked out. And you're married? Yeah. You're, you're still married? Yeah. And you've, you've been through some health issues. Yeah. Tell me about that. So I was here in California and uh, I mean, everything was shut down due to COVID in 2020. And my hair started falling out and I just wasn't feeling well. And I called my doctor's office and they're like, you know, we're really not seeing people unless it's cancer patients. We're gonna kind of wait till COVID dies down. And I was like, yo, yeah, I, like I totally get that. So I waited and didn't get any better. And we ended up, moving to where it's not important, but I went into the doctor because the COVID restriction weren't as, weren't as bad outside of LA County. And they're like, yeah, your white blood cell count is, is elevated. Like, let's see what's going on. So I went in and I had some tests done. I couldn't figure anything out. And then I went in to have a full body scan being a redhead with green eyes and skin like a ghost. Went in to have a full body scan and there was a spot on my foot. And it was like, I don't know, it just looked like a freckle, like, started itching. I thought, okay, maybe mosquitoes love me. Maybe it's that. And he said, what's going on there? I said, I don't know. And he felt it and there was a nodule underneath it. And he said, I don't know what that is. Let's go ahead and take it. So they biopsied it and it didn't look like anything on a poster, right? Like melanoma is like all these like skin growths where you're like, clearly that's cancer. I didn't know. And uh, he called me in December 21st, 2020. And as soon as I picked up the phone and it was his voice, I knew. And I said, okay, what do we do? And he said, we'll just cut it out. It'll be fine. It probably didn't spread. So I talked to the surgeon and the surgeon said, no, 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 no. I, there's a 3% chance it spread. And I got off the phone and I was like, I don't have a good feeling about this. And my husband said, ah, you're just being, you know, it's fine. 3% chance. Went in for surgery. They operated on my foot, took skin from my leg to close it back up, took lymph nodes out of my groin. And, uh, on the ninth day, pathology was supposed to come back in seven. And on the ninth day, he called at 7 p.m. And uh, yeah, I knew. 
And I remember I said to him, I said, you said there was a 3% chance of it spreading. And he said, I I'm sorry, you're my three percenter. So, stage three. Um, it was the most fit I've been in my entire life. Four kids. Been married for 18 years. And uh, stage three. And I looked perfectly healthy. So, it's a lot. And I, and I always thought, if I were to die, like if an asteroid comes tomorrow, what can we do, right? And I've lived such a great life. Like you can't even write the life that I've had. But to orphan my children, that was hard to even think about that, you know? It was hard. And the whole time, I had to keep it to myself. I couldn't be open about it because at the time I was on Stranger Things and I thought if they know, they might try to write me out out of compassion. Like, oh, she has to focus on her health. Um, let's, you know, give her some time off so she can focus on that. But, but I didn't want that. I just wanted to, to try to be normal. And uh, the show that, uh, that I host on the CW, you know, I, I couldn't tell them because if your host is out, there's a good chance it'll get canceled. And I have a crew and I love my crew and they have mortgages and families. So I just had to pretend <laughs> that I was fine. And I felt so alone, so alone. And I couldn't talk to anybody. And uh, I just basically had to fight it on my own. And then the place that I moved to, um, I didn't have time to meet anybody. So my only friends <laughs> were the oncology team, like my oncologist, my nurses, the phlebotomist. The way I found my way around the new town was based off of the oncology center, my cardiologist, all my specialists, and it was so isolating. It was so isolating. Um, and I remember when I showed up to shoot Stranger Things, they kind of gave me like a, like a double take because I had lost so much weight. And um, somebody made a comment to me like, <laughs> are, you, <laughs> are you being method? <laughs> Because my character's going through this really hard time. And I just laughed and I was like, no, I'm not being method. But they, you know, people were concerned. I was just terrified to lose my jobs, you know. And they're great. They're great. They never do it out of anything other than concern. But it's scary. I have children to feed. It's hard because I was trying to balance everything and act like everything was okay. And I couldn't really take off completely because I needed to work. So it's just isolating. And, and I would go on set of different things and I, I would hear people, you know, as, as we do, we complain about mundane things, the traffic, the weather. And I wondered if I'd be there by Christmas, I wondered if I'd be there for my kids' birthdays. And it, it really, it really changed my life. And, you know, once you've had one sort of cancer, you're at elevated risk for a secondary cancer. So it's never really like you're, oh, I'm in the, I'm in the clear, everything's good to go. It's more just, I had a second chance. How can I make the best of it and just stay really, really vigilant and hope I catch it when it comes back? Because it will come back, most likely. So it's just a matter of time, I guess, you know? So you beat that, the, what was in your foot and they said it spread? So when it was just on my foot, it was stage one. 
And then by the time they got to it, when they took the lymph nodes out, uh, the lymph nodes showed there was cancer. So it had spread quickly and they, they ran tests and I, I don't have any genetic markers for it. Um, melanoma is, is common in post 9-11 veterans. Um, if it's on the scalp or the head, it's mainly because of sun exposure in the desert. Other areas, it could be because of chemical absorption, all the chemicals that we're exposed to. So I don't know what it's from. There's not a genetic link there. But I do carry the gene and BRAF positive, which means that basically it kind of grows faster than it normally would. It could spread faster. So I've had to be just extra vigilant about it. And, you know, halfway through treatment, I was feeling okay. I was, ugh, I was just really run down. But I remember I, I went in for a scan and I went in for the results and she sits down, the physician's assistant, and she rolls the stool up to me. And I promise you, <laughs> I wanted to do this and kick the stool out from under her and run out the door. And uh, she told me that they found something on my scan in my liver. And I said, well, what is it? And she said, I don't know, but it wasn't there three months ago. And so, you know, I left thinking it, it was stage four and that was it. And for 12 days, until I had a biopsy, a liver biopsy, every morning I woke up thinking, I'm stage four and I'm going to die. My kids won't have a mom and I'm going to die. So thankfully, that's not what it was. Against all odds, that's not what it was. But I'll never forget how it made me feel and how it changed me and how that made me even more proactive. So right after that, I went and I scheduled a mammogram even though I wasn't old enough. I scheduled, I was 39 and insurance was trying to fight me. <laughs> I scheduled a mammogram, an upper endoscopy, a, a, a colonoscopy. I went and saw my eye doctor because melanoma can show up in the eye sometime. I went to the dentist and had my gums checked. I went to my OBGYN because sometimes it can show up in the nether regions. I checked my entire body like a hypochondriac. <laughs> and thankfully, everything came back okay. Um, and the sad thing is, with this cancer, people think, oh, you can just cut it out. You can't just cut it out. Once it gets into your lymphatic system, it's there. And next it goes into the organs if you don't catch it. So I just wish that those kind of myths would be dispelled and people don't understand how important it is. If you, if you see something on your body, you say, oh, okay, well, I'm just getting older, it's, it's normal. It could be cancer, just waiting and lurking. And by the time you go to the doctor to get it taken care of, you're stage four. And what then? because you didn't want to go to the doctor and it's prevalent in our society. I'll go later, I'll take care of it later. Sometimes there's no later. I'm really lucky to be alive. I told myself I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> said, I'm going to keep it together. So today you're, you're back working and everything is... Uh, everything's okay? Today I'm back working. I have been cancer-free for four months. I never wanted a tattoo in my life. Never saw the importance of putting anything on my body that was permanent. But I got this one when I finished treatment. It's Joshua 1.9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I don't know what other people believe, but I can tell you that God saved my life. And I would not be on this earth without the strength that he provided to me.
And I don't expect people to believe that if that's not your thing. Because it's not, it's my experience and it's what I went through and I know. So I'm back to work and looking at things completely different. And embarrassingly enough, <laughs> you know, actors, we have to actually memorize lines. <laughs> and the treatment did such a number on my brain that sometimes it's embarrassing because you go back on set and people who don't know think you just didn't prepare or you're, you know, ditzy or whatever. And I just, uh, my brain is just not like it was before. And it'll, it'll probably get better the longer I'm out of it, but fucking I'm alive. <laughs> you know, that, all that is secondary. This must have made some changes in the way you view your family and life in general. You know, I'm much more, um, I just, I don't care what people say or what people think. And I've always kind of been that way. But I just live by the mantra of, you know, other people's opinion of me is none of my business. They can think what they want. Uh, I do literally everything now. I was, I was always good at bucket list stuff because I always thought, well, why wait until you're 90 to do something? Why be the, you know, the, the guys at Niagara Falls who are in their wheelchairs and they're seeing Niagara Falls in the, in the retirement home? I never wanted to be that. But since then, if there's something I want to do, I just do it. <laughs> I just, I do it. And, and the world is so different. I, I'll look at a tree and people will see a tree and I'll see the colors and the shapes and the texture of the leaves and maybe something changed in my brain permanently, I don't know. But I see the world like I've never seen it before. And it's such an incredible gift. And, and part of me, you know, being that I was in the military, I understand survivor's guilt, right? Because I, I only lost a few people that I knew when I was serving. But after, you lose so many to PTS and people taking their own lives. And so I get the concept of survivor's guilt. There were six of us who were around my age, 38 to 42, who were diagnosed within maybe a year of each other that I knew. And three of them are dead. Six. Six of us and three are dead. From the military or from? Uh, some from the military, most from the military and a couple people that I knew. So four military, two oh, civilian. Okay. Just people I knew around my age. And three are dead. So there's a part of me that it's like, why? Why me? Uh, an acquaintance of mine, he lost his wife and we were diagnosed around the same time. And I just didn't understand why I'm still here. I'm, I'm eternally grateful, but I just didn't understand why. But with that being said, um, I think one thing that, that we lose when we put too much focus on why am I here, why am I here, I don't know why I'm here. And I don't know if I'll ever know, but I know that I owe it to the three of my friends who did not survive to live the life that they would have wanted and that they can't, whatever that is, traveling or trying a new beer or, you know, tucking their, their child in at night, kissing them goodnight. I owe it to them to experience it to the fullest because they, for whatever reason, they're not here, and I am. I'm sure I'm a mask by this point. <laughs> I've heard from so many people who've been through some of the most horrific things imaginable that we would all want to avoid. Yeah. And, and almost all of them have said they wouldn't have changed a thing about their lives. 
would you have chosen to have a life without any cancer? This sounds insane to people. But the greatest blessing God ever gave me, besides my children, was cancer. And I don't know how to reconcile that, but it's changed my life in so many ways. And even if it were to come back and get me the next time, I'm so grateful to have a second chance to be here, to wake up, to drink coffee, to listen to birds, to fight traffic <laughs> on the 101. <laughs> I wouldn't change it. The only thing I would want to change is I didn't want that heartbreak for my kids. That was hard on them. It's the only thing I would change. But you're more able to appreciate life now? <laughs> Understatement of the century. <laughs> Life is an incredible gift. So all the things that you want to put off until tomorrow, don't, because you, you don't know. And I was in the prime of my life and healthy. And we had just started building our dream house. And just everything in my life was perfect. Your career. My career. And then this. You just never know. So, so when you say, I'll do it later, do it now. When you say, well, I don't want to do it because it's hard, do it anyway. You don't, you don't know. Heck, I could leave here and get hit by a bus walking back to my car. But I would know that the last six months since I've been off treatment, I've lived even more than I already have. And I've said things to people that maybe they find too forward or too, you know, we live in a world of, of memes and <laughs> Snapchat. And, but now I'm just really honest about how I feel about people. And if I miss someone, I'll text them randomly and say, hey, I miss you. Let's spend time together. Let's do this. I'll text someone a random memory. And I think most people think, oh, I don't want to do that. I'll be a clinger or I'll be weird or, or I'll be overly sentimental. I plan to leave this earth with Nothing unspoken. And, and one of the hardest things that I did during my treatment, you know, people ask me, would you rather have a slow death or a quick death and not know? And I said, oh no, a slow, a slow. Because I was able to, to write my kids letters and make videos. And, you know, I, I wrote my, my boys are still young. My girls are grown up, but I wrote my boys letters for like their high school graduation, their wedding. I planned what I would put on my husband's match.com profile because I, I didn't want him to be alone for the rest of his life. Um, Cause he wouldn't do it, you know? And I got to, to do a lot of tying up loose ends that thankfully I didn't need to, but there's something to be said about having the opportunity to do it instead of just being snuffed out in a minute and leaving so many things left unsaid. What do you think most people who have not been through the things you've been through don't realize about their day-to-day -day lives or just how they're, how they're going through life? I feel like people, people get caught up in the everyday annoyances of life and that weighs you down. It changed me as far as if I go to 
my favorite restaurant and it's closed for whatever reason. You know, I get to try out something down the street I haven't tried out. Uh, I think, you know, it'd probably annoy most people. For me, it's an opportunity. Traffic, never ending traffic in Los Angeles. To me, I just get to jam out in my car and dance and be stupid and have other Angelinos look at me like I'm a moron. <laughs> um, <clears throat> little things. <clears throat> just little things. And I would say, if there's a way that you can find the silver lining in something, just find it. It's, it's, sometimes it's hard because you're annoyed as fuck, and I get that. But try to find the silver lining because there is one there. And my silver lining was... Yes, I had cancer. I'm still technically stage three NED, which means no evidence of disease, but I'm still stage three because they don't know. They won't know until it pops up in an organ that I'm stage four. So it's possible there's no cancer. There's possible there's cancer, but it just hasn't popped up in an organ. So I choose to just live as if I'm completely good to go and I'm completely healthy and fine until that scan shows that I'm not and then I'll deal with it. My silver lining is, yes, it was stage three. Yes, it was 18 months of treatment. Yes, it was terrible, sick. I was sick as shit, but it wasn't stage four. It wasn't stage four and that's all that matters to me right now. And the thing is, people don't tell you about cancer treatment. You think you know. And my cancer twin, my friend Leanne, she, she was a Marine. And we had cancer treatment at the same time on the same day, every month. Every three weeks, we'd have treatment. And she told me, they don't tell you these things. She said, you'll have massive bowel problems. You'll get hives. You'll be sick. You'll have heartburn. They don't tell you any of these things. They tell you like in the pharma ads, all the side effects, right? They don't tell you really how sick you're gonna be. And that it really, I felt far more sick from the treatment than I ever did the cancer. And you don't know until you go through it. What's changed the most in you? Is, is it your ability to be honest with everyone around you? <sighs> Not so politically correct, maybe? I've never been politically correct. <laughs> um, I'm very in your face about stuff, uh, but I'm just very candid. Candid with love. Um, I, I would say what's changed is there, there's just no tomorrow. There's never a tomorrow. So if I want to do something, I'm just going to do it. That's it. And I wish that's how everybody could live. And I know it's not possible for everybody. But I, I towards the end of my treatment, I, I've always been a volunteer EMT, well, for a few years now. And I, I joined the local department when I started to feel a little bit better toward the end of treatment. I joined the local department as an EMT. And I remember my chief came to me and said, we really need people to go to fire school. And I said, well, I'm not going to fire school. I'm 41, I'm not. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 we really need people to go. And what he meant is you're going to fire school, young lady is what he meant. And I went. And I was two months out of treatment and I went and I'm a volunteer firefighter now. And it's like stuff that I probably wouldn't have done before, but fuck it, you have one life and why not? It's the weirdest, craziest thing, like it's weird. And nobody at the department knows I'm an actress or whatever. I have a different legal name than I do in SAG, right? In SAG after. So no, like nobody knows. And it's fine because I'm not there for that. But shit like that I never would have done. They would have said, go in that, go fight that vehicle fire. Go, what? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <sighs> New lease. Wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. And good luck from here on out. I don't need luck. I got God. Thank you very much. Thank you.